Thanks very much for inviting me. I've got, I think, half of the researchers that I work with on this project are here, so it should be a lively conversation. So uh, a little bit about, about myself. Um, I'm a professor of anthropology at Northern Arizona University, but a graduate of the, the U of A program here. In between, I was a tribal archaeologist for the Navajo Nation, and I've been working closely with the Museum of Northern Arizona for a number of years now. And on a one course release, I serve as curator of anthropology there. So I'm mostly going to be talking about MNA's um, projects around bringing together art, archaeology, and um, contemporary Hopi arts and, um, and people and, and culture. And um, I want to talk about the history of this flower world concept just in, in terms of what I've been working on personally, and there's others who have been working on it who will, will chime in. I, I certainly hope if they don't, we can, we can call on them. So um, when I was a graduate student here, one of my very favorite professors, Jane Hill, who's with us tonight over here, she's waving her fork for you, was working on a a project to study songs in the Aztec language, Nahuatl, and related you know, Aztecan languages. And she was noticing that in all of these languages, there are descriptions of a flowery spirit world. So flowers, colored birds, <laughs> glittering light and, and colors. And this had associations for Aztecs of blood and, and warfare and the, the blood of warriors turning into flowers as it fell and flowery paths to the spirit world and flowery patios and all of this very evocative imagery that was only showing up in songs, not so much in other kinds of, of texts. So she was looking for that in other languages in that Udo Aztecan language family. And one of the Udo Aztecan languages is Hopi. And um, Ken Hill, is here today tonight. Um, he's here tonight too. He's a, a linguist studying Hopi language. Worked closely with Emery C. Kikwaptua, who, who I also worked with on this project, and Emery continued to work with us at the Museum of Northern Arizona. So Jane was working on the linguistics of this. And when I was a student, she hired me as a research assistant on a grant to see if we could find th this flowery imagery. So could we find flowers, hummingbirds, butterflies, um, glittery colors, rainbows, all of these, these things that are described in the Udo Azteca and songs, could we find those in material culture in the Southwest? So um, that's one of my favorite things to do is library research. And um, we found it. We found a lot of that imagery in Membrace, and we found a lot in protohistoric pueblos, especially Kiva mural paintings in the Hopi area and over along the Rio Grande, especially a site called Pottery Mound near Albuquerque and Awatavi and Kawaika on, on Hopi. And I had already been working on the Homolavi research program with Chuck Adams and, and Margo, who's over here, and was interested in Hopi pottery already. And we started to, to put together these ideas that um, this flower world complex was probably very old and probably spread with Udo Aztecan languages. But from time to time, it, and I have to use the metaphor fluoresced in certain areas, where it, just, it became strongly expressed in the visual arts. And, and that would include Membrace and, and Hopi. And that doesn't mean that, all, that everybody who expresses this imagery is a Udo Aztecan speaker, because all of their neighbors also adopt this complex of, of imagery. And in the Pueblo area, it becomes very closely associated with Kachina religion. And we have the specialist on, on Kachina religion, um, Chuck Adams, right there. So um, we wrote an, a couple of articles on, on this and presented our, our results in the early 90s. And then after I started working at the Museum of Northern Arizona, this kind of goes into to phase two. We had a project there to study Kiva murals in depth. It was a joint project between MNA and the Harvard Peabody Museum, which had excavated the Awatavi and Kawaika Kiva murals. And um, we have a book just out that took 10 years to, to produce. 
<laughs> called Painting the Cosmos, Metaphor and Worldview in Images from the Southwest Pueblos in Mexico. And this includes not only the flower world complex and the similarities in the visual arts between um, some areas of Mesoamerica and the Pueblos, especially Hopi, but it also includes um, a lot of verbal arts. So songs that Emery C. Kekwaptua had recorded and translated and then put in the written version of um, Hopi language with Ken Hill's help there. And since I don't get to use slides, this is really hard on, on archaeologists. You probably hear this from every speaker. We can't talk without slides, so I'm going to try reading poetry. <laughs> so here's an English translation of a Hopi song. When it starts to rain and rain, when the rains arrive, when the evening primrose flower maidens bloom along the sand altar, the little yellow butterflies in happiness will chase one another among them. They will, for their part, go along sucking from the different colored trumpet-shaped flower heads. As they beautify themselves with the flowers pollen along here, in this way, with happy hearts, we will be singing and dancing. And this is the kind of song that the Kachinas sing in the plaza to evoke this flowery spirit world that's not heaven. Sometimes Emery would say, it's sort of like Hopi heaven, but then he'd say, but, but Hopi heaven isn't up there or, or out there or away, it's in here. And it's the world that we bring about here through our songs and prayers and, and correct actions and, and hard work. So bringing the flower world into this world is the goal of Hopi uh, ritual practice, but, but also farming practices and, and correct living. So just for comparison, um, Patrick Lyons gave me this one today. He's been working on this as, as well. He's over there. This is from, from the Aztec. These songs descending from the house of the flower butterfly. I, the singer, hear these words of his from heaven, from his home, and these are angels, a uh, little Christian syncretism going on here that we don't see in, in Hopi, apparently, or at least the translator. This turquoise swan of his, God's gold-colored firefly, it's soaring along over his meadow of flowers. And there's a glowing then beside the drum, and in this green place house, a steady, gentle rain of songs. Some other lines from these. Um, I offer these, I scatter these, these green place flowers, marigold flowers. May all adorn themselves and put on jewels beside the drum. It's here that they're summoned with flowers. Here on earth that they're summoned with songs. Be happy, rejoice, friends. Turquoise swan flowers, roseate swan flowers are spinning. Oh, and they're your hearts, your words. These songs, these words of yours are whirled as flowers. Brilliant flowers stand blooming, and where these pictures stand, this Mexico lies shining. And, and th there's so many parallels here. And, and we could go into which um, Dorothy Washburn and, and Emery C. Kekwapta would do in their article in, in this book, line by line, what, what those metaphors are, are telling us. But some of the patterns that, that we see in these songs are a lot of references to motion, and to, to bringing things up and bringing things in, and the singer referencing song, so the, the act of, of singing. And as far back as the, the 300 AD at Teotihuacan, you have images in mural painting in, in central Mexico of humans or maybe they're deities, maybe they're humans, deity impersonators, with a speech scroll coming out of their mouth. And I think we're all familiar with, with that. But sometimes those scrolls have flowers appended to them. And Jane's hypothesis was that this is a visual representation of song because of this imagery going with song specifically. So uh, we, we did find a lot of this imagery in not only contemporary Pueblo ritual practice, especially Hopi, like the flute society's use of sunflowers to line the pathways that the, the flute priests walk, and the adornments of, of the kachinas themselves, 
but we, we found these image, images in the, the Kiva murals. And sometimes they're pretty um, schematic. So some of the Kiva murals you'll have um, just a, a circle with a dot. And we, we think these are probably flowers. And if you've seen um, Casas Grande's pottery, Ramos Polychrome, as um, Gloria Fenner has over, over there, these are often adorning the bodies of serpents, these, these dotted circles. And so one of, one of the ideas that I, I certainly can't prove, but it, it seems to me that, that these represent flowers all the way down into um, Oaxaca, really, into um, central and even southern Mexico. And in, in the Kiva murals, we'll have these in sort of grammatical placement. They're, the way these are, are placed on what Emery identified as the earth altar, the base band of a mural, we'll sometimes have these and sometimes have things that look more clearly like flowers with, with rays. Sometimes they'll be, they'll be crossed like this. And the way Emery described this from a Hopi point of view is that you don't draw biologically correct flowers in that concept. What you're, what you're doing is showing a conflation of the seed and the flower. And this is the germ of the flower or the life spark within the seed or the flower. Another symbol we were seeing a lot all the way from um, southern Mexico up to the Pueblos represents corn in the Pueblos and it's dotted squares with this germ of life in, in each kernel. And in Mesoamerica this also represents turquoise and jade beads and the symbol also represents crocodile and snake skin. So the earth monster and the corn that, that grows up from the earth and the, the turquoise and jade beads, the green stones, are, are all together in a metaphorical complex that we think comes out of the Olmec area, uh, as Carl Tauba argues um, in a number of, of articles. Um, Amaya Nest out of um, UC Riverside, who's, who's been looking at iconography from the whole Mesoamerican and Southwest world. So, um, so this is the research component, and I'm gonna, we could talk about that all, all night um, written many articles on it, lots of people working on that historical trajectory. So if, if this verbal complex comes up with the spread of agriculture, what else is coming up with, with agriculture? What are the songs and prayers you need to grow corn? And then what subsequent interactions are, are happening between people in the Southwest and Northern Mexico and all the way down to, to southern Mexico. So we're assuming that there's ongoing interaction. And we all, when we know pottery comes up later than corn, that's an idea that comes from the south. Um, we've got scarlet macaws from the Huasteca region at Chaco, at Huaputki near Flagstaff. We have now the residue of chocolate, cacao, in cylinder jars in Chaco Canyon. Um, everybody knows about the copper bells at, at Pakime and Hamolavi and other sites that came from West Mexico by way of Pakime. So we, we know about all these little material things that come from Mesoamerica, but what we're trying to look at is when do particular ideological complexes come up. And I'm not talking about a whole religion. I think Jane used the term part ideologies. So there's sets of symbols that kind of go together and you can mix and match and reconnect, especially as groups migrate. And one of the things Pueblos do, especially Hopi, is divide up re religious practice and knowledge and artwork and um, symbols among different family groups so that nobody has the whole story. You have to put together everything into a ceremonial cycle that's very inclusive. It's a way of integrating large villages of people with different origins uh, by giving each one a place in, in that ritual cycle. And it's, it's a, it is stratified and unequal. Some are more equal than others. Some are very powerful individuals, especially in the Carizan Pueblos that may be more directly on, um, descendants of, of the Chaco area. So um, we've got a lot more research to do with all of these topics. And, and there's more for everybody to do than we have people doing it. So I, I encourage students to do this kind of work. 
Um, the next couple things I'm going to say is where I get in trouble with scientists and students are telling me that, that they're, they're being told you can't do that. And you, know, you can't look at religion and symbols archaeologically. And what, you're, what I'm starting to talk about now is more what does this research mean to Hopi people today? What does it mean to their community today? Why is this important to do? Um, how can we use this research in presenting Hopi history and Hopi arts and Hopi culture and especially Hopi values? in a museum setting or in, in media settings. And some people say, well, then that's not archaeology. But I'm an applied archaeologist. I'm, I'm more interested in this point in relationships with communities than I am in getting the time-space grid exactly right. So I want to try to sit the fence and um, say science is really good, it's indispensable for finding out certain kinds of things, but it's the, not the only important thing, it's, it's not the only thing you can do, it's not the only way of knowing. And in some cases, science has its methods, the best methods in the world for certain things, but in some cases, it's promoting, the people who practice science are promoting a worldview that's becoming a little bit dysfunctional. And as usual, the physicists are way out ahead of us. And um, I, I may be following their lead. So the next phase of this, as I mentioned, was MNA exhibit planning. We wanted to do a big exhibit on the Hopi world and, and hopefully travel it. And in doing the consultation with about 40 Hopi individuals, including a lot of artists and educators, we said, well, what, what is the best way to present Hopi? You know, what is it that you want the world to know about your communities? And they said that, that we have the set of values that was given to us at the emergence into this world. And it includes a covenant for earth stewardship, that we, we made an agreement with the guardian of this world to, to take care of it and to live by these values, humility, hard work, um, family, respect, reciprocity. And we're trying to carry those forward in the world in the way we live. And that's what's being expressed in, in our art and in all of the things that you're studying. But we also want the world to know that we have challenges, just like everybody else. We're losing the language. There's um, alcoholism. There's drug abuse on the reservation. There's poverty. We have all of these challenges, just like other people do. And we're, we're trying to um, live by our values, but, but work through um, these challenges that we all have. So Michael Cabote, in particular, was a, an artist that we worked with a lot. And Michael was very open about being a recovering alcoholic and, and was doing a lot of parallels between his 12-step program and, and Hopi values and Hopi clowning in particular. So he had this whole story of the Hopi clown and how the clown goes out in the world and screws up and doesn't ever get anything right, but he's curious and trying to explore and he's really rude to everybody, especially the Kachinas. And he gradually comes to recognize his own dysfunction was the way Mike phrased it. And then the healing process can begin once he owns his own dysfunction. And so the Kachinas help him see the right way to, to live. And, and the clown heals and um, shows us all how it's, how it's done. And the, the most important thing for Mike was it's not easy. There's a lot of contradictions, a lot of changes. Nothing is ever staying the same. When, he, when you're talking about balance, Mike said it, it's not um, our mechanical idea of a balance where, okay, now it's stopped moving and this is the way it's going to be. Everything with this reciprocity, everything's in motion. So going back to those songs about the flowers, there, there are so many references to motion and moving and journeys and roads and pathways and, and walking. And, and Mike talked about his journey as a person having parallels to that journey of Hopi emergence into this world, accepting that covenant, accepting that they were going to lead a very difficult life, symbolized by the short blue ear of corn. And they were going to split up and migrate in all directions and learn different things and learn everything they could about this land and how to live on it before coming together where they are now in their designated center place. So we didn't get to build the exhibit. We it cost out at half a million dollars and the economy crashed just as we started thinking about trying to raise some matching funds. So it didn't get built, but a lot of it is in 
this book, and I do have the prospectus if anyone's interested in, in seeing it. I do have a copy of the prospectus. We can send that around. It's got a plastic cover, so you can go ahead and get um, tapas on it. <laughs> and this, this had a lot to do, this exhibit had a lot to do with traditional ecological knowledge and dry farming and hard work by hand in a desert environment, and the deliberate choice to take on a life of, of hardship and humility and, and dry farming. Irrigation's too easy. <laughs> there's, there's some really interesting um, lessons in, in Hopi traditional histories that I think can be applied back to understanding archaeology as, as well as archaeology contributing something to um, the narratives that where Hopis are trying to fit science with traditional knowledge because you have to do that, especially in court for land and water claims. So um, that's nothing new. Florence Holly Ellis was doing that kind of work um, more than half a century ago, but I'm, I'm proud to be doing that kind of work. So, um, so a lot of this exhibit is, is what do the Hopi, what does Hopi mean by the good life? It's not a life of leisure and having a lot of stuff. It's a life of, of hardship, but humility and honesty and family, family relationships and correct reciprocal relationships between this world and that spirit world that we were talking about, which aren't a dichotomy. They're interdigitated. So that takes me to my last point, um, what I'm working on now in, in my sabbatical year. And I think I'll just start this with what got me thinking about this. And that is about a year ago, in July, just before the home dance, where the Kachinas dance for the last time in the plaza and then go home. So this is right when the monsoon season is starting and the corn's really blowing and growing and the flowers are blooming and the butterflies are out and all of this is, has been realized in this world through everyone's hard work. Um, nature responding to human intentions and, and efforts that one of the Hopi villages realized they didn't have enough pipes to use in the kiva for preparing for the home dance. So they sent one of our, uh, Ramson Lamatawaima, an artist who's now on, on our board at MNA, they sent him as an emissary to MNA to say, we know you have some pipes <laughs> from our village from the 1960s. Could we borrow those back? And the director, who is a cultural anthropologist and understands these things and has worked with Hopi for a really long time, and I and the collection staff got together with Ramson to talk about this. And we said, we, we realized that the mission of the museum and the collection staff is to preserve and protect and they do all of these distancing techniques, wearing the gloves, everything's in a, cabinet, it's in a drawer, everything's carefully labeled, um, every little movement is, is documented. Um, these are not charismatic objects, they've never been on display, they've never even been published. They're, they're pretty simple, humble <laughs> artifacts made of clay with a reed stem. And so the collection staff was a bit taken aback. They'd never loaned anything for cultural use. And so Ramson was, um, he thought, well, I'm going to explain this in a way that, that I think you'll understand. Have you ever heard of Martin Buber? He's a theologian from Europe. And of course, our director, Bob Brunig, had heard of Martin Buber. And I'd heard the name, but I didn't know what the, the key thoughts were there. And the collection staff hadn't. So Ramson's explaining to us, Martin Buber says there's two ways of relating in the world. I, thou, and I, it. And museums tend to make things into its. And, and you relate to things as, as its. And Hopi doesn't have that. Everything is I, thou. And so he says, well, what's, what's this that you've got right here? And the collections manager said, a camera. He said, what's it made of? She said, um, plastic and metal. OK, where, do the, where does that come from? The earth? There you go. <laughs> and there was more to it than that, but you know, just to, to be brief, um, talking about relationships 
and what, what comes from the earth and what goes back to the earth and the proper life cycles of things. So we took away, um, Ramson and I, to write an article, two ideas that we thought needed to come into mu museum curation practices and then I think into archaeology generally. And that's that everything is animate in that everything's in the flow of life. So it's not like there's water in that glass and there's not in that glass. This one's got life in it and this one doesn't. Everything's in, in the flow of life. And we could use the term animate for that. And some cultural anthropologists, ecological anthropologists, are starting to try to reclaim that word. Um, Tim, Tim Ingold is an uh, ecological anthropologist in England that I've been reading a lot lately. I, I think he's got it. Um, he's saying it in a way that European Americans can understand and, and Europeans can understand. And I think he's saying the same things that that Ramson was about landscape and about artifacts. And we don't have a good word, artifact, object. I'm using artifact because that implies a relationship with humans. But I want to animate that somehow. And then the second idea is that things have life cycles. They're, they're made with intentions. They're made with jobs to do. And they naturally deteriorate. And every preservation archaeologist knows this. We're trying to preserve, but we really can't. We're just trying to extend the life of, of things. And I would phrase that more now, I think, as keeping things in, in the flow of life and, and keeping them active, but um, not, not obsessing over every little thing. So uh, he asked, how would the collections, Ramson asked, how would the collections people feel if the if the pipes were chipped or cracked in, in use. And they said, well, I don't know. It makes us uncomfortable. But you know, if that's what you want to do, we're willing to try this. And I said, oh, archaeologists love it when things crack, <laughs> especially pottery. I can see the temper. <laughs> I can learn more. The more it's used, the more I can learn about it as the way it had a relationship with humans. So the archaeologists were all over that. The collections people came around pretty surprisingly quickly. And the pipes went home, and they did their job, and they received new names. And I'm not publishing all of that, so uh, I'm telling you things that I'm, I'm not publishing in the article a little bit. And um, they came, came back to the museum. So they, they went home to take part. They came back to the museum for another cycle of rest and repose. <laughs> Might be a good way to, to phrase it. <laughs> so that they're not in a coma, they're not in a mausoleum. You know, they, they get to go home and be, be with people um, from time to time. And I think this is something we're going to be doing a lot more of at the Museum of Northern Arizona. It's completely different from repatriation, which is something we could talk about also. This is about cultivating relationships of communities, and these communities include non-human persons or beings or artifacts that are, the relationship is what we're focusing on, not the things. So um, I want to end up by saying that this isn't just something that I'm pulling out of Hopi and saying this is how we want to handle our Hopi collections or this is how we want to do Hopi archaeology, but to say that I'm, I'm seeing this kind of movement in ecological anthropology, in um, landscape archaeology, looking at the landscape as alive. So a lot of people using phenomenology, for example, um, with looking at landscape. For a long time now, we've been questioning that you can divide things into what's cultural and what's natural. That's got to go. Um, natural, supernatural. That's got to go. That's a distancing mechanism. We, a lot of theologians are saying this, that we've distanced ourselves from, from God with that supernatural category. Like Emery was saying, your heaven's up there, and ours is all right here and here. And um, the one that, that I'm concerned with the most in, in our museum is science versus humanities. And that's going to be a hard one to break because of our university structures and our funding sources, the National Endowment for Science, National Endowment for the Humanities. And I remember a UNM professor saying to me once, Kelly, science, humanities, they do not interdigitate. <laughs> <laughs> OK, for you, they don't. I, 
I don't know if they do for me. I, I, I hope they do. I really hope they do. And I guess I see science as being the most valuable set of methods we've got for finding out things, especially about the past and humanities as being more of a value system and a, an orientation and the reason why we want to know things and communicate the things that we learn. So reason versus emotion, it's got to go. And, uh, or we can, we can say reasoned things about emotion and about aesthetic response, I think. And um, I'll just land on, I'm still looking for a good word for this, like relational epistemology, relational ontology is what some scientists are using. And, and I don't want to mention Bruno Latour, so I won't. It's just the social scientists inciting French philosophers is just something that drives my Hopi colleagues crazy and a lot of my students to be honest. So uh, I don't really want to do that. And so I'm going to land on Erizem Kohak, who's a, a philosopher from Czechoslovakia, who had some very dramatic experiences in his youth in Czechoslovakia, seeing his country overrun by um, German and then Soviet tanks, and, and is very concerned with, um, with this distancing and objectification and um, the problems that, that we get into with um, capitalism, overconsumption, wasting. Um, so environmental ethics is his concern. And, and he says what we need is a repersonalization of the inanimate world. And that's what kachinas are, is a, only it's not animate. It's a personalization of the world which is animate for Hopi. So the whole world is animate. But what the Kachinas are is personalization of, English doesn't have the word, forces of nature, the, the rain, the clouds, the ancestors, all of these, all of these things that are hard to, to understand as persons until you personalize them with these songs, these images, and the, the performances. And, and I'm not sure performance is really a good word either. But enactment, how's that? You, you enact these good things in the world. And that puts a face on it. We can relate to it. We can have a relationship. Now, that's how everything becomes I thou. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> um, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, we are recording this, and the tape sounds really funny over the internet when we don't get the question on the tape. So if you do old school, elementary style, raise your hand, I'll get the microphone to you, and we can go ahead and record your question. I'd really appreciate it. So open the floor to questions. There's one right here. Have you or some of your colleagues looked at whole com iconography in this context? Just a little bit, and not since I did the study for, for Jane 20 years ago. So the best example we found is, is in the poster, the, the logo for this talk is a, a plate with sunflowers all over it with their CD centers. This is another possible schematic way of representing flowers. And a lot of archaeologists see this design and they say, oh, it must be peyote. <laughs> and it might be. <laughs> but it might just be the, the CD center of flowers because sometimes you get the, as we do on the Hoakam example, you get the petals on there as well. So a little bit of, of flowers in Hoakam pottery. Um, Emil Howard illustrated a, like half a page of sherds with flowers from Snake Town. So we're not seeing it a lot in Hoakam, and we're not seeing it anywhere very much in rock art, I should add. Which makes me, it makes me wonder about the seasonality of bringing out this imagery and things like that. I don't know. Yeah. Question right here. Well, actually, I work at a Hoakam uh, petroglyph site, and, and it is full of this imagery. I haven't seen anything like this the down here, ones, but, but certainly, oh. certainly up on the right. And, and oh, the, okay. the zigzag around the edge is much more regular than what you have made it, but it, it, well. <laughs> it appears, it appears uh, several times out there, and of course circle dots are 
well-known and divided circles. Not so much, well, grids, but without the germs in the middle. But okay, so we've got these. Okay. Those three a I lot. I stand corrected. <laughs> the uh, question is what site? Can you repeat that, please? Uh, the site is Sutherland Wash, also known as Baby Jesus Ridge. I have to check that out. Bunch of questions right up front. <laughs> yeah, I'm really interested in the repatriation that mm -hmm. you mentioned in this context. So repatriation is mandated by law. So we have this process that, that we have to use that's really burdensome on both museums and the tribes, but it does get it done. So you know, I'll say I think NAGPRA is a, a good law. I think the implementation of it could have been much more efficient and well-funded. And it, it could have, it's, it's a burden on, on the tribes to have to fund all of the documentation that they have to do and to keep up with the the paperwork, but ultimately I think it's working very well. And what a lot of, what I would like archeologists to at least think about with repatriation and especially reburial is, is this idea that things have a life cycle and they're supposed to deteriorate. And if they don't get to disaggregate and disintegrate and deteriorate, then they can't reintegrate as something else. So if you, you stop the cycle when, when you put things in climate controlled rooms and to do that to people is, is really outrageous from, from the point of view of, of many people around the world, not just Native Americans, but, but most Native Americans are, are not like the Aztecs who had skull racks and um, whose descendants put um, saints relics in churches and, and did preserve them um, forever. Most, um, at least the farming tribes that I'm aware of, village farmers, like, like the Pueblos, uh, when, a, when a person's body isn't allowed to disintegrate and return to the earth, then you're taking really vital <laughs> substance out of that cycle, and that that's very harmful for us today. So the ancestors can't help us with our cycle if, if, theirs, if they've been taken out of theirs. And, and that's something that um, is, to some extent, specific to communities, and it's hard to talk about. And, but I, I think a lot of archaeologists aren't getting that, so um, I think we do need to, to talk about that more. Um, most, most tribes would probably just prefer to leave it as, this is the law, let's, let's do this as efficiently as possible, and let's not try to have to explain ourselves. But now, now that we're, we're also... Um, mandated to repatriate culturally unaffiliated remains. This is where archaeologists are saying, but if it's culturally unaffiliated, why should it go back in the ground? And the Hopi view is it's affiliated to somebody. It's a human being. That's a person. So. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Chuck. A uh, couple of questions. Um, uh, relating, and I pretty much agree with uh, everything you say. You That's because I, I got think. most of it from you. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you've gone a long way beyond that. But a couple of questions. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, do you think in this context that it's ethical to continue to excavate archaeological sites for research purposes only? Uh, and secondly, if you do or whatever, um, how would you, if at all, change the way archaeologists um, excavate or engage with the material world while they're you know, working in it? Is there a different way that uh, we should think about it, look at, at it, maybe collect information? Um, I haven't been consulting so much on, on excavation. I've, I've so far been doing a little con consultation on curation. Right. So I haven't thought about that as much as, as, as I know you have. And, and I'll use Homolavi as a great example. There's consultation with the tribes from especially with Hopi, the affiliated tribe, from the get-go. So I think when archaeology can answer questions that Hopis have, they're, they're more than willing to, to discuss it. And if, if I recall, the practice there um, is when human remains are encountered, record, be very respectful in your behavior, record, um, bring the tribal representatives down to have a, a look and do what they need to do that may, might involve um, some, some ritual activities. 
and, and then you, you rebury or cover up in, in situ. And when that helps answer questions that Hopis have about their history, their migrations, their land use, my experience and, and yours, I think, is, is they're all for it. But, um, and then, of course, if something's going to be disturbed by a road, it's much better to have an archaeologist remove, learn what you can, and respectfully rebury than to have bulldozers going through it. So, but um, I don't see I don't see Hopi saying, "Yeah, let's dig a let's dig a cemetery and do a bunch of DNA analysis." But it's up to them, is is my point of view. If they wanted to do that, then I, I think the museum would would get behind that. But I don't think I don't see that happening because of the the worldview that I've mentioned. You'd, let's not disturb it unless it's inadvertently disturbed. Question over here. Um, <clears throat> well, to follow this line of thought a little further, maybe too far. Um, <laughs> Love too far. <laughs> well, if we, if we take seriously the notion that objects have, or including us, things, have natural life cycles, then we shouldn't stand in the way of the decay of any, any object naturally. I mean, either ourselves through life preservation mm -hmm. or objects in museums. I mean, it begins to call into question the whole idea of things in museums being preserved for us to look at and beyond their sort of natural decay. I was I, is that... Uh, yeah, that uh, would do be... Do you want to go that far? That would it? be the fundamentalist interpretation of this. but. And, and there are fundamentalists among Hopis and Navajos and, and every other other group, um, not just our own our own culture, and and I do know a few fundamentalists who think that. That sounds like a uh, Yeah, I don't want to. Um, what? A strict interpretation, <laughs> a narrow traditionalist. Well, but but traditionally people are very flexible and adaptable too. Um, and, and Hopi's value flexibility as well. And what I'm hearing is that what, what the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office's um, advisors and, and other Hopi consultants that I've worked with want is a seat at the table in the discussion. So there really is a lot of interest among artists especially in being able to come to the museum and see and handle baskets, pottery that their grandparents or great-grandparents made. And they're very interested in having their own work preserved there for their great-grandkids. So they see that sometimes something's in a museum because it has that job to do. So I think they're giving some of these things, um, the things just isn't the right word, some of these baskets, say, um, credit for somehow wanting to be there or being willing to be there because they have a story to tell or a job to do in that museum context. But then when it comes to let's all wear the bright blue gloves and never touch anything, then that's a little out there. Um, what, what I think they would like is to have things in the museum where people can come visit them and interact with them. And sometimes that might include touching without gloves or handling or, or turning things over uh, manipulating, again, being able to move things and to, to have direct contact with things is very important. So the idea that something, if you do that, something might last 500 years instead of 2,000 years if we didn't touch it, that doesn't really bother most of my Hopi consultants. Good. <laughs> Other questions? Any other comments from the research team? Sure. I just wanted to say I was really interested in the remark you made about what you said about the issue of the, the time. Um, because linguistically, it's just extraordinarily difficult to untangle that. There's been this continuous contact for 4,000 years. And it's all muddled up together. <laughs> and it's very difficult to figure out, you know, which pieces came and went when. Yeah. Um, 
And so I think that's going to take a lot of very original thought. And I think some of the originality is going to come from the communities, you know, who have angles on those histories that our, our methods don't give us. Uh, so I, the, the timeline, I think, would be one really important place where, where collaboration and, and would happen. And there is a timeline in Hopi migration stories, as, as you all know, um, where the water clan with the, the water serpent was later than, than the bear clan and some others. So there's, there's a sequence there, and there's a directionality which, which clans moved in which directions on the landscape and came in from different, different directions. So I think that's, um, that's one approach that, that could be used. And one, one of the things that I'm kind of moving toward that also gets me in huge trouble with scientists, with fellow scientists or people who think I'm, I'm not a scientist because of this, is I'm becoming less concerned with the linear time-space grid myself. And a lot of what the landscape archaeologists are, are doing is talking about the sedimentation of time, place, and, and persons. Um, Keith Basso's work on um, Western Apache place, landscape places, wisdom sits in places, does, does a lot of that um, from an Apache point of view. But I, I'm seeing British landscape archaeologists using this in, in British megalithic sites also, where you've got Bronze Age people using Neolithic sites in particular ways, and um, not so much continuities in, in use, but layering of, of meaning and, and use in, in places. And um, a few British archaeologists have actually um, called chronocentrism of traditional archaeology a form of phallocentrism. <laughs> and, and even I'm not going that far. <laughs> but. Uh, but that, that's another one of these things that I think we, we might try some very creative thinking is to try to think out of that time-space grid box on some of this also. Well, all right. Um, thank you, Kelly. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you for having me. <laughs>